Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. These brown bags are sported, supported by your uh, membership in the Preservation Association of Lincoln. We encourage you to join to support these activities. To join, you can go online to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. He is a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln, and he has served as on the Historic Preservation Commission for more than a decade and is currently on the Nebraska State Historical Society Historic Preservation Review Committee. Um, Jim's talk today is titled, The History of Lincoln Parks. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Thank you, Raylene. Well, Lincoln's parks are interesting and have been around since the very inception of the city. Uh, and today there are over 70 parks in Lincoln, uh, encompassing a little more than 5,000 acres. The smallest is several hundred square feet. The largest is uh, around 1,500 acres, so large. Uh, at one point in history, about the year 2000, Lincoln was noted as having more acres of park than any other U.S. city per capita, okay? And a lot of that comes from undeveloped parkland, but an interesting statistic, and whether it still holds true or not, I'm not sure. And I sort of defined a park as any place where you might take your lunch. So the parks you'll be looking at today might include this room, but don't. Um, the first park in the city came along with the Capitol Commission in 1867. And when the first plat of the city was drawn, this is not the first plat, this is sort of a rendition of the first plat. But over on the left-hand side, you'll see a four square block area, which was designated as Lincoln Park. Another four square block tract was the State House, which is the Capitol building, and it sits where it does today. And the University, uh, then known as University Place, which confuses people, it has nothing to do with the city of University Place, which will come later in the 1880s. Uh, the park, the university, and the capital still encompass the original four square block uh, area, about 10 acres each. And at that time, it's interesting that they placed the university, the capital, and the parks on an equal footing as to how much room we would need. That has changed a little bit through the years. The university has spliced over a little bit. Uh, the dotted lines at the top, just for your information, are the old city of Lancaster. And Lancaster's south border was Locust Street, and Locust Street is today's O Street. So the dotted lines at the top, you'll realize that every street and every block, they don't coincide, because in Lincoln, the streets are wider and the blocks are larger. So it was that the city got its first park with the inception of the city of Lincoln. In the 1870s, it was known as 1870, excuse me, as Lincoln Park, but it was not a park. In fact, the city council leased it to anybody who wanted every year for between $5 and $10 a year, and the land was just literally farmed over. Uh, it wasn't until 1878 that a man by the name of John McAleen, or McAleen, or however he pronounced it, planted 500 trees in the park and charged the city $125. They died. Uh, they were replanted a few years later. All of them died. Uh, they retried it again uh, in about 10 years from the early inception, and they all died. Uh, we had a terrible time getting water to them, uh, and they just didn't have a way to do it. They died, and we're having the same trouble today. Uh, 1882, J. Sterling Morton uh, came along, and he donated 200 cottonwood trees. Now, these trees are indigenous to Nebraska and should survive well even in drought periods. Uh, most of them died almost at once. Uh, the rest of them that didn't die were taken over by a forest fire or a prairie fire, grass fire, and wiped off the face of the earth. So uh, nothing came of those trees. And the park was still rented out to anybody who wanted to rent it just for farming purposes. It was also in the 1880s that we drilled our first Lincoln City water well. And it was over in the northwest corner of this park. And a standpipe was uh, erected in the northeast corner of the park. And that served the city. Uh, producing about one million gallons of water per day. And if you're watching our consumption today, you know we're talking about uh, in the 60, 65, and even 70 million 
uh, gallons of water a day today. And on the quiet day, which is Monday when nobody waters, uh, nobody washes their car, we still are using about 35 million gallons of water a day. Uh, then, uh, in 1940, uh, more trees were planted, and you guessed it, they all died. Then in 1951, something called the American Forward Association got together with the Cooper Foundation and the Lincoln Park Department. They raised $35,000, and trees were again planted in the park, and guess what? Most of them survived. In 1954, Lincoln Park was rededicated as Cooper Park in honor of the Cooper Foundation, who had put up most of the money. Then in the 1990s, the park changed a little bit uh, when F Street was closed and part of the park was appended on to Park School as part of their playground. But for all intents and purposes, it's uh, about the same as it was then. There was one brief period in there, about two or three years, that it was known as F Street Park. Otherwise, it was pretty much known as Lincoln Park. An area that we certainly wouldn't consider a park today was also a one square block tract of land given by the Capital Commission. And this, by the way, is a capital AL Commission. Today we have the Capital Commission, which I think is OL, correct? Bob and Matt. Um, and so the Capital Commission today relates only to the building. Uh, the original Capital Commission related to the city, the placement of the capital of Nebraska. And one of the things the Capital Commission gave to the city, in addition to Lincoln Park, was a square block of land, 9th, 10th, O to P, which will be known as Market Square, which will be kind of a quasi-park, and that's the reason it figures in here. In this picture, we're looking across that block, which would today have Old City Hall in it. Uh, we're looking towards the west. O Street is on the left. When uh, Lincoln took over from the city of Lancaster, there had been one building which was built on this little park hyphen-like square block of land, and that was a meat market, which we see in this picture is just about to be moved off. In fact, the whole picture shows it's on rollers, uh, and they'll just pull it away. Um, the post in the middle uh, is a flagpole, and we can actually date the picture if you're interested right down to within a week because of that flagpole. It didn't stand very long. This park is sometimes referred to as part of Federal Square. Over in the middle of that block, dead in the middle of the block, uh, a well was drilled by a man by the name of Mr. Eaton, uh, who was paid by the city, and he drilled that well to produce water, not for the park. Uh, he wanted to, the city wanted water primarily to fight fires and secondarily to supply drinking water to the city of Lincoln. Uh, the well which they sunk there uh, was an artesian well after some unsuccessful other attempts, but the artesian flow was salt water, and here we see that original artesian flow bursting through the ground. And there will be not just a well, but also a fountain placed there for the park, which we'll see in a second. And here is the park as it uh, will uh, sort of uh, come into being. This picture is probably about 1880s. Uh, we can see the second Capitol building on the left on the horizon right there. The old city hall is there as uh, the US Post Office, Federal Courthouse, and US Customs House. On the left, of course, a gazebo or bandstand, so it has become now a park, the entire north half of the block, and at the point where the sidewalks, the radiating sidewalks meet, is the well, um, and now a fountain where you can get a drink of that great salt water. Uh, interestingly enough, this water tasted so bad and was so brackish uh, that it took on a mystical quality and became a curative. Uh, people said it would cure almost anything. Uh, people would carry it away in buckets and bottles uh, and drink it, but basically it was brackish salt water. Um, it still pumps water, that well still, that artesian flow still flows, we think, although artesian flows, which downtown Lincoln was dotted with, most of them have dried up because there's no recharging of those wells. We carry all that uh, recharge water off through uh, storm sewers off down into Salt Creek. Whether this one still pumps or not is problematic, but it may or may not. And here we see it developing as a park. And it was so used for a while. Here's looking across the park towards the west, um, across that fountain again, and we can see the Lincoln Hotel with a couple of additions over there, which, uh, and I have always said that if you looked at this picture and just showed it to anybody, you might say, this is a corner of Central Park in New York, and they might believe you. Uh, it did look like a very uh, city-oriented park. And of course, they've recreated that fountain 
uh, and with some adaptations over directly to the east of Old City Hall today, but it is not that fountain, although pieces of it still exist in the city nursery. Uh, this is looking through the park, uh, about 1910, 1911, 1912, somewhere is in there. Looking towards the southeast, we can see the fountain on the right-hand side just behind the uh, old city hall, and we can see a park now takes up about two-thirds of the north half of the block because uh, about 1910, 1909, the post office will move into their first third of their new building, uh, and the old building, uh, which was the post office, will be sold to the city of Lincoln for $50,000 with the proviso that it remains the property of the city of Lincoln so long as it is used for municipal purposes. And you'll find there are, is still at least one city office in that building. Uh, I don't think the federal government wants it back, but at that time, the way they sold it to the uh, city, um, if it ever ceased to be used by the city, they could take it back. So we still have a park on the, on the area, and I'm not sure whether the gazebo lasted very long into this period or not. But around World War I time, the middle third of that post office building is built. And then finally around World War II, we find the entire uh, third, three portions of the new post office are built. This is looking from the southeast corner across towards the uh, northwest. It's kind of hard for people to look at that building today and realize that it was built in thirds. So I threw this one in just to show you that we still had two blocks or two small blocks, if you will, of parkland on either side of the old city hall we see here. With the coming uh, of the city, the first tree was planted in the city of Lincoln, uh, sometimes called the grandfather tree, the grandpappy tree. Uh, it was noted as being on the southwest corner of 24th and L. Uh, the tree was originally a maple sapling which was out near where the penitentiary is, and it was brought and planted on the property belonging to Luke Lavender, somewheres near his cabin, uh, and the oil painting shows it directly to the back of the cabin, which would make it right in about the middle of the Ben and Martin Public Library today, because Luke Lavender's cabin was more or less on the alley directly north of the Ben and Martin Public Library. So this tree was planted there originally, but as the city grew and the tree was little more than a sapling, it was moved over to 24th and L. Uh, and there it sat, and uh, every few years, one of the newspapers in Lincoln would send a photographer out. This particular picture is from a book published in 1923 uh, to take a picture of it and tell the story of Lincoln's first tree, because if you remember back to uh, one of my first talks here maybe 15 years ago, there were no trees in Lincoln initially. So this was uh, an important thing. And then finally in the uh, 50s sometime, uh, the assistant city forester, Warren Andrews, went with a reporter from the Lincoln Star out to take the uh, traditional picture of the grandpappy tree and write the story. And guess what? Lincoln Park Department had cut it down. <laughs> down it. Now, uh, I like to tell a story that way because it makes a good story. But in fact, maple trees don't live all that long. So it was probably either dead when they cut it down or already on its last leg. But this became part of the Antelope Park chain. Uh, that picture was a little out of uh, sequence. This is taken from the vantage of the Lincoln Hotel looking back. They've moved the fountain in this picture uh, to the west edge of the lot where the federal building is being built. This is just before the final third of the building is being built. Uh, at this point in time, the pressure in the artesian well will not force the water up to fill the fountain. Uh, the uh, University of Nebraska Engineering Department was trying to figure out a way the students were to pump the salt water over to the well so that water could be still uh, be in there, the salt water. But unfortunately, they were unable to do it. They discovered that salt water doesn't like to be pumped. It's just almost like trying to pump acid. And so they gave up on it. And basically, in its latter days, this uh, fountain gathered rainwater and leaves and was disassembled, taken out to the park department, and the final third of that post office building was built. Uh, the next park is an interesting park, and it really was a park, but we don't ordinarily think of it as a park, and that was Wyuka Cemetery. Uh, now, originally, Wyuka Cemetery was given to the city of Lincoln, again, by the Capitol Commission. Uh, the first cemetery in the city was at 7th and G Streets, but it was not an official cemetery. Uh, but obviously, even uh, there were American Indians buried in this, they think, before 
uh, the city of Lancaster developed, and as a city began to develop, even when there were only a dozen people here, people did occasionally die, and they were simply interred in this area around 7th and G Streets. And they continued to be interred there until 1881, when the city of Lincoln or the Lancaster County Health Department declared the uh, uh, cemetery a nuisance, and they were, uh, as much as possible, reinterred at Wyuka. But unfortunately, virtually all of the graves down there did not have markers, and there was no record of where people were buried. So uh, clear into the, virtually up into the turn of the century, people told me that if you would dig a hole, even sometimes dig something to lay a sidewalk, you were apt to find or could find human bones uh, quite naturally. So uh, the next park is going to become Wyuka. And this is kind of Ed Zimmer's story, so I'll make it very quick and brief. The Capitol Commission gave the city of Lincoln uh, a land for a park, but actually, in fact, it's a state cemetery. So it's not a city cemetery. But the land that they put set aside for the cemetery was 160 acres of land near the asylum. It was on the west side of First Street and to the south of Van Dorn. And when the commissioners of the cemetery went out to look at it, Salt Creek had flooded and the cemetery land was underwater. So they went back to the Capitol Commission and asked for permission to sell that land uh, and then repurchase land with part of the money. Uh, and they bought land. They started with 80 acres uh, on O Street and ultimately ended up with around 200 acres of land where we have Wayuka today. The park was designed by Augustus Harvey, uh, who was one of the people who drew the plot of the city of Lincoln, and it's drawn with curved streets, no straight lines, and so forth. And with it came Lincoln's first park. And certainly we don't think of cemeteries as parks, but this was being used as a park while Lincoln Park was still being farmed. This is the original gate uh, with a sign over there telling visitors what the rules are, uh, probably closer to the corner. This was the house where the caretaker or custodian lived. The first interment was a young lady by the name of Eugenia, if I'm pronouncing it correct, Morrison, who was buried there in October of 1869. So the city of Lincoln was already just a smidge over two years old when the first uh, burial occurred at Wayuka, which is a Suian word roughly translated to mean place of rest. There's also a Wayuka cemetery in <laughs> Nebraska City, which tends to confuse people. Uh, and the park, excuse me, the cemetery in Lincoln is a state cemetery, not a city cemetery. Uh, these gates were then built a little bit later on. And these are the ones that most of us remember. There was also a creek running through there. In 1886, they also built what is now the oldest building still standing in Wayuka, which is the receiving vault we see there. Probably looking towards the southeast in this picture, there was a creek which went under O Street and fed that uh, little pond, which is reconstructed in roughly the same area. The white picket fence over there is O Street, so we're looking towards the southeast in this picture. Um, the building was designed by a man by the name of J.H.W. Hawkins, who also designed the Phillips Castle at 19th and D Street, so a prominent architect designed it, and the oldest building there. This is the entranceway, the office, and the home of the caretaker, As again, as I remember it. We're facing towards the northeast in this picture. Uh, this is a picture of the parkland, and people did, in fact, take the trolley car, which came out that far on O Street, uh, and used this as a park. It was the only area where you could go on a Sunday afternoon and have a picnic or a park. Uh, the bridge, which is roughly P Street, running left and right, uh, was intended to be uh, maybe even the primary entrance to the cemetery at one time. Never happened. The bridge is still there. It's a bridge to nowhere that isn't in Alaska. Okay? Uh, and the, the houses are probably still there. And, of course, the little house in the middle was originally at that time for swans. 1925, they moved a greenhouse, which had been at 24th and D Streets, out to the cemetery. And it's not clear to me completely whether this is the Fry and Fry greenhouse or another one, but it would be very near Lincoln High School today, 24th and D. It's the best way to think of it. 6,100 square feet of glass house. And, of course, the cemetery at that time went into the business 
of selling flowers, primarily for the use of the cemetery. But they were also, for a time, selling flowers into the city uh, until the Lincoln florists disagreed with that, and they finally had to limit their sales only to uh, cemetery uses. And, of course, that meant they didn't need all this glass house, and it was summarily removed. Um, then, in the 1970s, they sold off the corner property for a U.S. post office building, which is now closed. And you could buy it if you want it's for sale. Uh, I don't think anybody's bought it. Uh, and at that point in time, um, about 2000, by the year 2000, they redesigned the entrance, put, tore down the old entrance building, redredged the lake, and they're going to build a new house, but not for swans this time. And you can see straight ahead to the north, the, that bridge is still there. They just worked around it as they went. Uh, there are currently approximately 60,000 residents uh, at Wayuka. So it's one of the largest cities in the state of Nebraska. So you know and no longer used as a park particularly, although that land down there around the lake is certainly park-like and, and, and would make an excellent park setting. I suppose some people in the neighborhood may still use it. We won't go into a great detail about the next park because I did a whole program on this park at one time, and that was Capitol Beach Park. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, the park developed originally. Uh, a man by the name of Big Nell uh, put in what he called Burlington Beach, and he so named it not because the Burlington had any ownership in it, but because it was on the right-of-way of the Burlington Railway. Uh, he quickly put in a dam on Oak Creek and flooded the lake. It was a 1,000-acre lake, uh, the depth of about six to seven feet. And, of course, this is the point where the last saltwater lake occurred from the great saltwater flats as it uh, shrank in size. So... That's where Capitol Beach Lake originally came from. And in fact, they'll buy the Belle of the Blue, which was a boat in Beatrice, Belle of the Blue River, uh, and bring it up and have uh, boat rides and so forth as the park develops into more than a park, which is what it really was originally, just trees and picnic benches and that sort of thing with the Belle of the Blue. They'll also put in two swimming pools. The first swimming pool will just be a capture of uh, salt water on the edge of the lake. Uh, the actual swimming pool will come along a little later. They will pump salt water from the middle of the lake bed over here um, and produce a lake. They'll also bring in sand, not produce a lake, produce a swimming pool. They bring in sand so that you can have a sandy beach and a salt water pool. Uh, and the draw was that salt water is easier to swim and float in. And in the meantime, not only have they continued to develop the parkland around it with trees and gazebos, uh, and so forth. They've also begun to develop at this point in time a considerable amusement park with rides and so forth. But people did, still did bring their lunches out and have a Sunday afternoon in the park. I never was enamored of this park, or this swimming pool, excuse me. Uh, I only went out there a couple times. A friend took me out and I discovered that if you get in the salt water and then you get out and you lay in the sand, you will discover there are thousands of tiny little crevices in your body you didn't know were there, and you will itch for days. <laughs> this is an aerial view. Uh, on the right-hand lower side is the swimming pool. Now the amusement park has developed, and the jackrabbit or roller coaster. The lake is, in this picture, beginning to recede because after the original dam is put in and is there for probably uh, well over two decades, the county came along and said, wait a minute, there's a dam on Oak Creek. You can't do that without our permission. And they made them dynamite it, and the lake slowly receded. Uh, another decade went by, and a new owner thought, you know, if I dammed Oak Creek, it would flood the lake. So he did. And it filled it back up again. And it took years again before the county said, wait a minute, you can't build it. And they dynamited it again. Well, finally, Mr. Koppel is going to change all that. But here we can see the lake receding. But you can still see the picnic grounds and the treed area around it. If you go out there today, I defy you to find anything of this. It's literally covered now with houses, apartments, condominiums, and so forth. It's almost impossible. You can find the street, and that's about it. Uh, this is along the Antelope Park corridor, if you will, which stretches from roughly 24th and O Street to the corner of Sheridan Boulevard and 33rd Street, or also better known as Bob Ripley's Backyard. Okay? He's in the park. Uh, and so this part of the park is interesting enough where we're very near the children's zoo, and this is where the first attempt to quarry stone, hopefully to build the first capital, was attempted, but eschewed. And the only stone that I know of that was quarried out of here to build with was used to 
uh, build the foundation of the Canard House, which is still standing, and the first Capitol building. We instead went to uh, primarily a quarry near Blue Springs, Nebraska, and a couple of other minor quarries for stone that didn't last at all. So we, we should have used the stone along there. Uh, and although I'm not sure, somebody told me that in their new um, dredging, straightening, and they didn't channelize Antelope Creek by the Children's Zoo, but they did go in and put a bike path along there and paved it and put in retaining walls. And I have been told, but haven't been down there to take a picture yet, that they left an outcropping of this stone so that you can go down and see where this uh, stone is still exposed. It's very soft. It's, uh, I guess, a little, maybe a grade better than sandstone, but certainly kind of a, if it's low-grade limestone, would that be a way to put it? I don't know. Uh, another park occurred in the middle of an intersection. Uh, this one was right behind the Capitol building. Uh, and unfortunately, this was our first attempt to have a traffic circle in Lincoln. Uh, and it didn't work at all. Uh, we had one gentleman downtown who was a wholesale grocer who liked to drive his car and tipple at the same time. Uh, and on at least two occasions, he drove his car into this uh, Thompson Fountain or the Neptune Fountain is what the center part was called, and the outer part, the entire thing was called the Thompson Fountain, given to the uh, city by Mr. Thompson, who also sold his home uh, to the state of Nebraska to become the first governor's mansion. Another story. Bob and Matt can tell you that story better than I. So with this disruption in traffic, they gave up on the idea of traffic circles forever. Okay? Pretty much. They disassembled this, and it is moved to Antelope Park. Now, this is Antelope Park. Antelope Park comes about not as a park to begin with. It starts really with that city water well down in Lincoln Park, F Street Park, Cooper Park. And when we reached the point when we were able to take a million gallons a day of fresh water out of that by drilling specifically to a depth, there is about a one foot bed of glacial, glacial water that's clear water. And of course, you drill a well much in the downtown section of Lincoln today, and if you're not careful, you're going to get salt water. But they knew exactly how deep to drill this, and they, they tapped that one-foot layer of clear glacial water, which runs from north of Lincoln out towards Denton, I'm told. Uh, but at any rate, when they reached the point where they needed more than a million gallons a day, they moved a side of the original well and sunk another well to the same depth. But as soon as they did that and they started trying to suck water out, they were taking out more water than that pool of water, if you will, could supply. And it started allowing water from the other aquifer next to it to merge with that water. And guess what? That water was salt water. So as they tried to increase the flow from a million gallons a day, it became salty. And Lincoln's water became salty. So they had to shut down the secondary well. And now we're going to start looking for water. And they'll look for water uh, along the Antelope Creek uh, area, or creek if you're not from Lincoln. Uh, so in the city of Lincoln, about 1905, will purchase 41 acres of land at roughly 27th and D, 27th and A, for $13,500, primarily because they want to sink water wells. Uh, and with that, of course, they're going to end up with a little over 30 acres of land that will serve no purpose for drilling water, and they will instead make a park out of it. And this is an early picture of where the uh, creek sort of wanders through the trees in that area. Uh, one of the people that will subsequently donate land to the park is William Jennings Bryan. Here he is shown 1907. He's given 10 acres of land as part of his farm. Now it's hard to conceive of his farm running from 48th Street and Sumner clear down here, but apparently he owned land down here. Whether it was contiguous or not, we don't know. I, I kind of don't think so because it would have had to come through the Woods Brothers, one of their uh, horse facilities, and it may or may not be true, but at any rate, he gave 10 acres of land, and here he is, 1907, uh, dedicating this land. Um, mayor of the city of Lincoln, W.E. Hardy, who was also Hardy Furniture Company, uh, suggested the name Antelope Park, which is a, just a streak of brilliance on his part. The fact that it ran through, Antelope Creek ran through, it probably had nothing to do with it, but he decided it should be called Antelope Park and gets the credit for that. Not too astounding a discovery. Now, we're back in Washington, D.C. in this picture. And in this picture, we see the U.S. Treasury building being built. And as it is being built, these are the pillars which are put up to the, on the Treasury building. When the Treasury building was replaced, those pillars 
were stored, and in 1914-1915, they were purchased by a friend of William Jennings Bryan. And Mr. Cotter Bride, or sometimes Mac Bride, I'm not sure which is his name, but I see it both ways. Um, Cotter Bride donated the pillars to the city of Lincoln. Uh, this would be like seven or eight years after Mr. Bryan gave 10 acres of land to form the entrance of the park. Uh, and they will be resurrected in Lincoln down at 24th and O, roughly. And here we see them. Uh, we're looking through the O Street entrance to Antelope Park towards the northeast in this picture. Uh, the two buildings which we see are still there, interestingly enough. The one on the right is the one, uh, part of it is Knight's Plumbing, which is a Lincoln landmark. Uh, and the one across the street is now a trophy shop, Rick Stein's Trophies. It's been Nielsen's restaurant. restaurant. It's been also Chet's Transfer was in that building for a while, but it's still there. And I see uh, in the last couple of days that they're reopening the windows on the second and third floor, which is a really good sign. I hate to see buildings boarded up on the upper floor, so maybe they're going to get do something up there, and who knows, maybe they're going to tear the upper floors off. You just can't tell for sure. So this became the entrance to the park, and there's a tablet, uh, which doesn't show in this picture, uh, recast from metal salvaged from the battleship Maine, which had been sunk in Havana Harbor, and they recast it as a plaque which describes where the pillars came from. Uh, this will stand for quite a while until finally the park department uh, manager points out that it's being used as a park in lot, and he can no longer keep people out of it. So he convinces the city that they would be well money ahead to sell that park land uh, as a commercial property, and it's sold and it becomes a grocery store and a drugstore, and now it is an office supply store. So that's where the park uh, entrance was for a while. They will then take these pillars, disassemble them, store them in the city nursery, probably right close to that well that we saw in fountain we saw a minute ago. And they'll also save that plaque, which explains it all. They will then, during the bicentennial year, resurrect those uh, pillars, a couple of them, and put them back up out in Pioneer Park. Now, if you're an architect, you know that pillars are not straight, although your eye perceives them as straight. They actually are sort of like this, so that your eye perceives them as straight. And when they disassembled them and stored them out in the city nurseries, all well and good. But when they put them back up again, they paid no attention to this formula, and so they actually kind of go like this. Uh, and the one laying on the ground is sort of to represent a ruins. And also, they resurrected that tablet, that uh, bronze tablet is out there, too. So, still there out in Pioneers Park. Now, another gift is solicited from a man by the name of W.E. Alt. And Mr. Alt was, uh, at this point in time, he was in Lincoln for a while. Uh, but also, Mr. Alt uh, was living in Omaha at this junction of history. And they asked him to uh, sell them more land which would be along the same corridor, because they do want to perfect a park, uh, a string of parks along Antelope Creek. And they set a price, and Mr. Ald agrees to the price. But the city can't raise the money. <laughs> and it wasn't very much. It was a few thousand dollars. I don't think I wrote it down. Um, he was just going to buy, uh, sell them those 15 acres of land. But when the city couldn't get the money, he said, OK, I'll give you the land. So we're, we're, we keep kind of spreading out Antelope Park. And these pillars were ultimately erected with a tablet uh, thanking Mr. Ald for giving the land to the city of Lincoln. And of course, next to it, or directly to the north of this picture, to the right, to the north, and those smokestacks, chimneys over there, are the water wells and the power plant on A Street. So we're looking from Joe Seacrest's front yard trolley car track here, looking towards the northwest in this picture. And they're still there. And then Ald Pavilion is also built as a honor to Mr. Ald. He doesn't put up the money for this, but the city does. Now, Ald Pavilion, for a brief period of time, bizarrely, will also be the clubhouse in the basement for a city golf course, which will be to the southeast of there. That will later be abandoned and turned into parkland. Then it will later be turned back into now what we call the children's golf course. 
but for a while it was just a regular regulation golf course. And if you go into the basement of Old Pavilion, at least the last time I was down there, the locker rooms are still there. Showers are still there, uh, not used. The basement of that building is in pretty crummy shape. But uh, So for a while it was another type of park, a golf park. And this is just a picture looking on, on a street that's no longer there. I think they've torn the street up in the last month or so. It's just gone. You can't get off of A Street, Bob. It's, I think they're doing something with water or something in there. I don't know what it is. It's completely blocked off. Uh, the next part of Antelope Park will come along in the 20s, and we will um, set up a tourist camp, campgrounds. And about the best way to think of where this is is if you know where Lincoln High School is and you go along Capitol Parkway, continue towards the southeast, you'll come upon a building that is the maintenance building for the Lincoln Public Schools. And right in that area is where this tourist park was located, somewhere in there. And I can't exactly note it, but uh, around the 20s uh, is when this came about. The, this picture is in a book, 1923. Uh, you could camp overnight there for 25 cents, and it said there were cabins, although I can't, can't be sure where the cabins were. They were 75 cents a night. And this was a little building where you could buy camping supplies, little grocery items, and so forth. Um, in 1932, the city purchased what had been really a private enterprise or a concession, uh, and it became um, the city park. And we think that probably some of it went across what we call the Randolph Cutoff in there and into that practice ball field, which is directly southeast of Lincoln High School, um, probably in the 30s. Then in 1921, uh, Joe Seacrest, J.S. Seacrest will donate an additional 40 acres of land, of his land, to further string out uh, the chain of park. This is uh, the park superintendent's home, which sat uh, kind of between the retired teacher's fountain and the children's zoo. Uh, and this, the city, the park department's cat house uh, was later replaced with another house and lived there quite a while, literally until the children's zoo came along. So we're looking pretty much east in this picture from 27th Street. And there was a circular drive up in there. There was a great amount of planting, uh, some of it obvious with the sort of subtropical plants that undoubtedly had to be replanted every year. Uh, and fish ponds were a uh, factor on this. This was still all on the east side of uh, 27th Street at that point in time. And this is where we moved uh, the original Thompson Fountain to in the corner of the, what's now the Children's Zoo. It would be over clear in the northeast corner of the present Children's Zoo. Uh, and we can see here it has no water in it, but we can see the metallic, uh, the metal figures in there. Uh, before it's filled and kids are playing around in there. Sometime in the late 30s, maybe as late as 1939, the metal uh, feature of the park, which is called Neptune's Fountain, was sold for scrap metal. And the story goes, perhaps anecdotally, I'm not, I've never been able to nail it down, that this was sold to Japan, this metal, which is sort of a tragic way to look at it as some of it may have come back home to Lincoln in the form of wounds and shrapnel uh, after the war. But that's anecdotal, but it's, it's, you never let a fact stand in the way of a good story, do you? So it, it, it has just become a fact. So they will sell off the interior portion. For a while, this ring will still stand in the park. Then later, they will dig a pit inside that ring, and it will become the Cota Mundi, which is kind of like a little bear habitat. Now, the uh, fountain has been disassembled, and it, too, is being stored in the Lincoln Park Department's uh, grounds. And over in that corner now, I think they have camel rides or something, horseback rides and stuff like that. That's where it was. So it moved and it moved. Now, when I was a kid, all over in Antelope Park, from roughly 27th Street uh, up to A Street, there were scattered these buildings which were made of stone. Uh, Oftentimes, I and others inaccurately call them cobblestones. They're not true cobbles. They're just stones. And these were stones which were used to build alleys and streets in the city of Lincoln. And as they tore them up and paved with concrete, asphalt, macadam, and so forth, they salvaged that stone and built numerous buildings down in the park. Uh, maybe, not maybe a dozen, but numerous buildings like this. Small buildings for many, many different purposes. There's another one. 
This one, this building would be directly to the south of the caretaker's cottage, for example. And there's a little detail on one of them. And already you can see they're beginning to weather pretty badly in the 1950s. So they will, become, they will come down. Uh, another part of Antelope Creek, of course, is, is what we call the Sunken Gardens. But originally the Sunken Gardens was Antelope Creek's cul-de-sac. And the creek is now straightened out, but originally it made a cul-de-sac over towards the southwest in there. Um, at that time, there was a golf course directly to the south of what we now call uh, the Sunken Gardens. And that golf course was the Happy Hour Golf Course, which was, uh, it ran roughly from A Street almost down to the Sunken uh, Gardens. Uh, and it was a private golf course, which will be dissolved and be reconstituted as the Lincoln Country Club down at 7th and Washington Garfield, roughly from A to South Streets. That's where the Lincoln Country Club got started by name. Uh, it's an offshoot of it. It isn't exactly the same group. Uh, other people put it together. And this is a, a picture. The area down there was used for uh, lots of things, that cul-de-sac. When they straightened the creek out, of course, it became a natural for a dump, and it became a dump. Uh, just not an official dump, but where people would throw things, old washing machines and, you know, stuff. And in the wintertime, it made a great sledding area because it was uh, sl silt, uh, uh, it tilted down, slanted down towards the creek bed. So along comes uh, the Depression, and about that time, Harry and David Fry, see, not Harry and David, but Henry and Sarah Fry, Henry and David, I think, had the winery, and that was a different group, um, who owned the, the uh, Fry and Fry greenhouse part of it, they uh, gave the city of Lincoln uh, considerable land up in there, about an acre, which had been this cul-de-sac in uh, Antelope Creek. And at the same time, J. Seacrest also gives two lots of land right in there. Um, and then Ernest Bear, who would have been, I think, the father of Harley Bear, uh, maybe the grandfather, but I think the father, um, he was sort of the head of the Lincoln Park Department at that time. And Fred Goble designed a park to be put into this old cul-de-sac area. So first they filled it in. And this being the Depression, uh, one of the things they did was it, uh, in 1931, Mr. Bear uh, used it as a way to hire people. Uh, and he hired 200 men at 40 cents an hour to literally fill this land in with wheelbarrows and shovels. And the idea was, yes, they could have used heavier equipment, but they wanted to keep the maximum number of people employed. So they used shovels, literally shovels and wheelbarrows, and they smoothed it all in and cleaned out the elbow, and we're looking now towards the east. That's 27th Street running left and right in the picture, and it is the Sunken Gardens, of course. Uh, he also found colored rocks uh, all over uh, the county of Lancaster and brought them in. He planted 416 trees and shrubs in there, uh, and all of the stones were supposedly red and tan, and there must have been thousands or tens of thousands of these. And where they went, I don't know, but they seem to have disappeared. It cost the city of Lincoln to build this park totally $2,500. So a great bargain. And when it snowed, it became a great <laughs> spot to take photographs, of course. And when it rained, it became a lake. <laughs> they had not figured out a way to drain it. Uh, and then this picture uh, comes along quite a bit later. We've uh, got the two fish ponds in it, the concrete fish ponds. And uh, we've got a waterfall back there. We haven't quite yet got the statue of Rebecca at the well yet. That's going to come along 1932 to 1935 when uh, Ellis Berman is hired to construct several uh, statues for the park department. He builds the smoke signal in Pioneers Park. Uh, Pioneer Woman, which is on 33rd Street, uh, almost in Bob Ripley's backyard. 33rd, and what would that be? 33rd and um, Melrose, yeah, something like that. And that is still there. Uh, also, the uh, War Memorial, which is in an Antelope Park directly to the northwest of Old Pavilion. So Ellis Berman is hired, uh, again, another one of the WPA projects, F-E-R-A, it's a specific project, to design these. And this is a, a picture late uh, in the old design's life. 
And there's Rebecca at the well. Now, Rebecca um, was kind of an attraction uh, to kids, unfortunately, and she needed to be constantly repaired until finally she had been repaired so many times they gave up. Uh, and uh, we'll finally replace her. The same is true of a fountain which used to be where the Rose Garden is to the north of the zoo building, which was also another WPA building. Uh, but this, this uh, will be replaced with a new figure of Rebecca at the well. And she will be a metal casting and she'll be at the top instead of the bottom of the area. Then we're going to come along and, uh, of course, uh, by the way, she's made out of cast concrete. That's one of the reasons she didn't last very long. So not very good. Uh, we're going to tear it out and literally start over again to have the, the sunken garden that we have in there today. Literally 100% new, new ponds, uh, new statuary, everything. Now, still today, uh, if you walk uh, along the old railroad track, the two bike paths, one smooth concrete, one a meandering asphalt path, you will see many, many, maybe a dozen, 15 of these small buildings, some of them brick, some of them concrete block, uh, and some of them wellheads this tall with just a wellhead sticking up. Uh, this is the old well field, which is where Lincoln got their water until ultimately we ran out of usable water there and had to go to Ashland, which is where we get our water today. Now, the question that I would like to ask Mr. Oberst is, are we again using this well field? I don't know how many gallons it would give us per day, but I don't see any indication that we are. And yet I was told not five years ago that they could and still use it. And at that time, in the five to 10 year ago bracket, when you would walk along there, you'd just walk, suddenly one of those wells would start pumping. Uh, and for a time I was told uh, that also if we had excess water from Ashland, we could back pump it into this aquifer here later to be re-retrieved. Now, are they doing that today or not? I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, inquiring minds want to know. Uh, but these are still all along there, and whether they're still active or not is a question I can't answer. And, of course, also during WPA, we get one of our two zoos built. Uh, the other zoo will be at Pioneers Park, and this will be an outdoor zoo. This zoo will also be partially outdoors. Uh, the animal cages primarily to the east uh, of this down to the, uh, the creek, to, uh, to Antelope Creek. Uh, outdoors, including bears and so forth, small animals. And this is now, last I knew, was an indoor playground. Uh, the next park is not even in the city of Lincoln, but it is now a city of Lincoln Park, and that's called Bethany Grove. As Nebraska Christian University, which set up its uh, existence in the little village of Bethany Heights, it started in 1888, and it was literally bankrupt from the day it opened. Uh, and as it fell on hard times, because there was a, a depression in 1893 that very nearly wiped out Wesleyan and, and did wipe out Nebraska Christian University, and one of the things that happened was a donor from Omaha, again, a man named by, by the name of Samuel V. Cotner, will give Nebraska Christian University a tract of land, which hopefully they could sell off and use the money to keep the college going. Well, land wasn't selling. So instead, it became what we called then Bethany Grove. Today, today we call it Bethany Park. Uh, as the city of Bethany ultimately comes into the city of Lincoln, the St. Lincoln Park Department takes over Bethany Grove. And this is the old tabernacle, which was located there. And the tabernacle was used for such things as they closed down Epworth Park. Uh, they tried to have Chautauqua here, but it really didn't work. It wasn't easy to get to. Uh, so it didn't work, but this was the original uh, building there. And as the city of Lincoln took over, they took over the park. But virtually as they took over the park, they discovered that the park did not belong to the city of Bethany. It belonged to Cotner University, which had been named in honor of Samuel V. Cotner, who gave them the, the land to save the university. Bethany didn't own it. And when the college went under, their property became part of the property of Bethany Christian Church. Bethany Christian Church maintained Bethany Grove. So when the city of Lincoln took it over, technically, they shouldn't have because it belonged to the church, not to the city of Bethany. But nonetheless, it became Bethany Park today. And 
the site where this tabernacle was, there's still a concrete slab which has been built over twice and now has a building on it. Um, and this is one of the things in the summertime we used to have uh, carnival days. And there's a young lady on a kind of a swing, but it's a tight uh, wire that she can ride down on. I think the OP, or not, what would it be? The uh, OSHA would just have a conniption fit at this today. And this is a bridge over Dead Man's Run. There's still a bridge over Dead Man's Run in there. And now when the park was established, it was a complete rectangle, a perfect rectangle. But if you can imagine where Cottoner Boulevard cuts off the west edge of the park, it cuts off at an angle. And it cut off the northwest corner of the park. And it left a small triangle of land northwest of Cottoner Boulevard that was part of the original park. Does that make sense? So Mr. Love sets up a popcorn stand over there. It's private property. He is able to get it from the church, apparently, which is what the city should have done, but didn't. So in this tiny little triangle, Love's popcorn stand. We don't know what he put in that popcorn, but it says, we make you like it. Okay. <laughs> My feeling is probably the first sack was free. <laughs> then he had you. <laughs> now, when Love's Popcorn goes away and the city begins to expand out there, one of the things that Bethany does not have is a fire department. And the city sees this triangle of land and says, whoa, that is now part of the park. And that becomes where the fire department building is built on Connor Boulevard down there, that little triangle on the other side of Cotner Boulevard, which perfected the rectangle. This was a, another bridge over Dead Man's Run. It was actually a, a nice little park, and I remember very clearly when I was in like Cub Scouts, we met in the second tabernacle, which precedes the previous one, and we went in for a blue and gold banquet dinner at like 5.30 in the afternoon. And as it wound down, about 7.30, someone went outdoors and noticed that it had been raining ever since we went in, and the creek had come up so high, we could not get out. The fire department bought boats. Boy, was that exciting for a Cub Scout. The fire department bought boats out and took us out. Now, our family lived on the south side, so we had to spend the night in Bethany. It was a great adventure. I couldn't get over Connor Boulevard. Another picture in the park someplace. I can't be sure where this is, uh, but I don't think this is Bethany Park. I think this is the next park we want to talk about, which is Cushman Park. And Cushman Park was located uh, directly to the west of the city on the railroad. And there were uh, livestock pens out there, very elaborate, large livestock pens. Then starting at about A Street to the north, what would that be, Coddington? Man, you, you, we have these pictures. I think it's Coddington West, A Street to the north. Cushman Park came into being. And Cushman Park was a privately owned park. Uh, it had a horse race track. It had two railroads serving it. Uh, but primarily, it was a, a gathering place park, not an amusement park at all. But it had a lake, and it had the horse racing track, and a hotel. And today, I think they've resurrected a small lake out there in this uh, residential area, but it bears no resemblance to the lake which they had. Cushman Park was very active for quite a while, but went away, and it's now just part of a real estate development. And the livestock pens and everything are also long ago. Can't really find any of it out there today. Uh, the university started parks uh, uh, very early on when they established a herbarium. This is their greenhouse and herbarium. We're looking from Old Main, which stood roughly where would be directly to the uh, west of Sheldon Art Gallery. We're looking towards the northeast. Uh, and the building on the right, Nebraska Holiday, where the chemistry building stands today. And this just shows as they develop a park, uh, and it will be parkland, and people will use it as a park uh, with all sorts of plants grown for medicinal purposes primarily. But a park does develop around it. And today, a park, it, and it still exists in a manner of speaking there because the land in the center of the picture, which is where the main building, the University Hall, originally stood, and then next to it, the sculpture garden or the garden and park. Uh, I've never seen anybody take a picnic lunch in there unless they worked at Sheldon, but some people probably do, students. Um, obviously, private parks will develop, and those, these private parks will be more like golf courses. 
This is originally what's called Eastridge Country Club, and it's kind of in the middle of this picture. Uh, the golf course was from A Street over to about um, Sumner Street, a little actually a little further to the south of Sumner, almost up to South Street, and it was an old farm property. Uh, and this was the clubhouse. There's a swimming pool directly to the back or to the east of it. And as uh, Hampton buys the land and develops the land around it, as he develops it, one of the last pieces of land he develops is on the southeast corner of 70th and A. And until he built that office building in there, you could still see where one of the greens sat right there. It was still sculpted. Uh, the swimming pool and the uh, East Ridge Country Club will laterally become East Hills Country Club. And it will be used for banquets and so forth and a private swimming pool. And it's literally the last part of East Ridge Country Club to disappear. Uh, and it's now a, uh, there's a little, it used to be Union Savings and Loan, and now there's a hospital, more or less, uh, rehabilitation hospital and uh, eye clinic and skin doctors and so forth. And I can't think of what they call it. Okay. Um, this is the Lincoln Country Club, which came about moving from down on 7th Street between Washington and Garfield uh, out to 24th Street and Woodsdale. Uh, with the help of the Woods Brothers, they will trade the old country club property for this land in the middle of land that they owned. Uh, for one thing, they thought the land around it would be much more saleable if they had the country club out there. So they also aided in the construction of the original country club building, which is still there. Uh, and they built around it, just as everybody else has. Uh, swimming pool has been replaced as well. So this is the original Lincoln Country Club or the second location of it. This is the old country club. This is the clubhouse at 7th, on 7th Street between Washington and Garfield. And this is the governor's home, not the governor's mansion because it did not belong to the state of Nebraska, but this is uh, Governor Butler's home, which was on 7th Street between Washington and Garfield. And it was acquired after they moved out of the happy hour. And they moved here, put the veranda porch around it, and made it the country club of Lincoln. Interesting building. Also, it was an uh, area where when they moved the golf course out to 24th Street, this became a truck garden. Uh, and they used to sell garden vegetables off the front porch. And for a time, there was a satellite grocery store in this building from Ideal Grocery. Also had one, of, at one time, they had five stores in Lincoln, and this is one of their sites. This is Hillcrest Country Club, which started as a Shrine Club, uh, but unfortunately the Shrine Club uh, started their operation during the Depression. And not only that, they, they started at 29, but by the time they got it going, it was the Depression. It was so far away from the city of Lincoln that it didn't, didn't function very well. Uh, and ultimately they discovered that not enough Shriners played golf to make it work anyway, even if it had been closer to the city. So it became a private uh, enterprise now owned by something called Easto Realty Company. And this is looking at the original swimming pool, 19, early 1930s swimming pool. Bob, were you a lifeguard out there or did you just swim there? I can't remember. Pool manager. Pool manager. Robert Ripley, boy pool manager. <laughs> yes, and the pool is exactly the same pool. And the baby pool is exactly the same pool. And the filtration system is exactly the same filtration system. But every, and, and by the way, that's, you know, that filtration system, although it's 1930s vintage, is still up to, up to code. It's just as good as, as they could build. So this is an early picture when it was very briefly the shrine. Uh, somebody taking the last putt right there, I think. This is, of course, the park that I think we've spent considerable time on and we won't spend considerable time today. Um, this is Pioneers Park, uh, which began in 18, 1928, roughly, when John F. Harris asked his childhood uh, playmate, George Woods, to find 500 acres of land that he could give to the city of Lincoln as a park in honor of his parents, uh, George Harris and his wife, uh, as early pioneers in the city, and it would be called, of course, Harris Park. But before the park was ever developed, Mr. Harris changed his mind and said, no, let's name it in honor of all pioneers, which is a good thing to do. And in thanks, the city of Lincoln named the viaduct after him. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And this is one of the early pictures of Pioneers Park. We're looking at the original plantings. Of course, this was just all farmland. Uh, 
Chet Ager, Ernst Herming House, and Mr. Woods chose the land and began to turn it into what would become a park. Subsequent purchases have been made, 100 acres at one point, and then again a little bit more. Uh, and of course we have a development with the smoke signal, which is dedicated in the 1930s, and the buffalo, which is placed in there. The CCC, the WPA, and other groups planted a myriad of trees out there. The buffalo was given by Mr. Harris as well. And that, I am told, is where we have to end the program today. Uh, it's not enough to do another full program on, but I uh, thank you very much. And I think we will probably have time for a few questions, if you wish. So, Robert. No, no, no corrections now. I said questions. The tabernacle in Bethany Park, yeah. is that in any way a uh, somewhat comparable footprint or location to what the enclosed shelter is today? It is not only the same footprint, but I think part of the poured concrete base probably is, is there. Uh, the original tabernacle was replaced with another building, which they didn't call a tabernacle. And that's where the blue and gold bank was held. And then that building, uh, I think, using exactly the same footprint as the second, and I think the poured concrete as well, becomes that beautiful architectural structure which sits there today. Did you design that? <laughs> it's a beauty. Okay, another question? Or did I answer that? That's Sometimes, I, you, know, you know, now that the political... Uh, programs are all in full swing. You know, you ask a question and you get an answer, but it isn't necessarily the answer to that question. So I wasn't sure whether I answered your question or not. Go ahead. Do you know roughly where the, the original tree or the grandpa tree was located at 24th and L? I mean, that's roughly where the footbridge path came off and, and ran through. I can't locate because I don't remember it. Even It would have been there, I suppose, when I was a kid running. And you, you know, lived in that area. And so probably you saw it, but didn't relate to it. It'd be my guess. But I can't locate it any better than, you know, that corner. And it, because it doesn't appear on maps. Uh, obviously, quite obviously. And it would just be within that area where they're littered with ball diamonds and so forth. And again, the story is told, and perhaps apocryphally, I don't know, that they re the reason the park department tore it down was they wanted to build a parking lot for the ball diamonds, which they ultimately did not do, but the tree came down. And that's, that's all I can tell you. And in that 1923 book, which I, Matt, do you still have a copy of it? Uh, you, can, you find that picture in there, uh, and it may give you a little... If you look at the background, maybe you can see something which will identify more closely where it was located. I can't. Yeah. Gosh, a true answer to a question. Yeah, man. Um, after the country club left the um, the Butler site yeah. at South and Washington, did that immediately become the KKK lodge? Uh, no, it had a, it had a few other uses before that. It's uh, before the KKK, uh, Earl May operated a nursery in there, uh, and also that is the building where he asked permission of the Lincoln City Council to start a radio station, and that radio station was KMA. He later married a young lady whose father had a nursery over in Shenandoah, Iowa, and he moved the radio station. And it was after that, um, another prominent Lincoln family purchased it for the state headquarters of the KKK. It was only in operation there for a couple of years, really. The KKK went from nothing to being extremely popular, and in less than five years, it was gone, literally gone. Um, and then it became a roadhouse. Uh, and the roadhouse uh, existed for probably, you know, a decade or so. Um, and then it sat empty for, again, many years. And in fact, oh, what's Jerry's last name? A friend of mine that uh, was in my Sertoma Club told me he played down there in that house. And behind it was the electric KKK cross. It was still just laying behind the building. Then ultimately it was torn down. But the Woods Brothers began selling off that land, but it didn't sell very well originally. Uh, and so most of the houses that we see down in there, a lot of them are built in the 50s and even the early 60s, late 50s and 60s, even though they presumably were more than happy to sell it in the 30s. It, it didn't sell very well for some reason. So the house was torn down in the 50s? Yeah, I can't remember the date. Uh, let me see if I can come up with that date. I'm going to say it was the very late 50s, like 59. I can't I have it in my notes, but I don't remember the date now. 
But yeah, it wasn't torn down towards the end, and it was empty at that time, yeah. Okay, the, the question was Cushman Park. No, Cushman Park is probably, uh, and we, we're now going off the air. I, I thank you all for coming. I'm sorry, I thought we were well off before. <laughs> when he said two minutes, he meant 20, I guess. I don't know. Now let's see, you want a Cushman Park.